Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to be looking at investment. Uh, investment is the process upon which firms are going to raise the uh, financial capital for the expansion of the production and their factories. And so this is a really important uh, lesson. It also delves into the uh, stock market and also uh, interest rates and what causes people to want to borrow or not borrow or save or not save money. So we'll begin this lesson on investment by looking at the uh, factor markets. So goods and services are produced using the factors of production, remember land, label, capital, entrepreneurship. Uh, and those factors are traded in resource markets, which can be visualized using the circular flow model. So when we look at the circular flow model, one of the things that we see is that the price of a factor of production is called the factor price. So those factors of production, the supply of land, the label, the capital, the, those items which are provided by households, the price of those is determined in factor markets. And remember what happens, of course, is we see the supplies going into the factor markets. And then in these factor markets, the firms will hire land, label, capital, entrepreneurship, and they're going to be paying wages, rents, interest, and profits. So that's what they're paying. Now, the price of financial capital is interest. So that's really one of the, our primary focuses for this lesson. So you can see here for this particular lesson, the interest rate is the price of capital. So you'll notice there, firms pay wages, rents, interest, and profit. Firms pay interest for financial capital, and they're paying it, of course, to the households through the factor markets. So financial capital consists of the funds that firms use to buy and also operate capital goods. So understand that the financial capital is going to buy and operate capital goods. Now this does include things like factories, but it also includes the technology, the machinery that is used to actually produce these goods, to buy those equipment that's used to produce some sort of good or service. So financial markets are the people and firms who lend and borrow money to finance the purchase of physical capital. So understand that financial markets, which is a type of factor market, is where the buying and selling of financial capital takes place. And the payment for that financial capital comes in the form of interest. So let's look at our financial markets. So business growth cannot occur without investments. It takes enormous amounts of money to uh, develop and to grow businesses. And that's not exactly something that is just sitting around in people's pockets. So therefore, investing takes the work off of the businesses. And once they're able to invest, then that allows them to generate capital for growth. So investment requires the acquisition of funds to buy and maintain capital goods. This is gained through fi financial markets. So the two primary financial markets, the stock market and the bond market. Now, stock market trades shares of firms. One of the things you'll notice in this group of lessons is an infographic on stocks, which will give you an, a good explanation of what stocks are and how they work. So stock markets trade shares of firms. Now, stock represents a claim to partial ownership in a firm. In other words, stock represents a percentage. So when you buy stock, you're buying a percentage of the company. The greater the percentage of the company you own, the greater the profits earned when the firm earns profits. Uh, this is the incentive to those buying stock in the market. And corporations use the sale of stock to raise money for the purchase of goods. So when corporations want to raise money, they'll issue sales of stock. People will buy the stock, the corporations get money, they use that money to purchase capital goods, and then when the corporation makes a profit, the people get a percentage of that profit. It's called equity financing. Bond markets trade certificates of indebtedness that specify obligations of the borrower to the holder of the bond. And I'll explain what this means. So basically, there's three primary characteristics of bonds. So the term represents the length of time before the bond matures. So when you get a bond, that is for a set amount of time. Now, the credit risk is the probability that the borrower will fail to pay some of the interest or principal. So let's say you get a 25-year bond. Well, then for 25 years, you, you get that money immediately. You don't pay it for 25 years, but when that bond matures, it's time to pay. And every year on that bond, it's collecting interest. So the credit risk is the probability the borrower will fail to pay some of the interest or the principal. The higher the credit risk, the higher the interest rates. And then tax treatment is the way in which the law treats the interest on the bond. 
So how is that going to occur? So when you look at the characteristics of bonds, then you can kind of see, and a lot of times you'll hear that, that school districts or cities, they, they, they float a bond. And what basically they're doing essentially is they're borrowing now and then they're gonna pay later plus that interest rate. So a big question, of course, is do you or don't you invest? Um, because if you just randomly decide to invest, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make a profit or you're going to get enough money raised. So, so in order for firms to determine the best options and their best actions, they run what's called a cost and benefit analysis. So the demand for financial capital develops from the firm's demand for physical capital to produce goods and services. So as you need new machinery, of course, you need new money to be able to purchase or maybe to upkeep said machinery. So in determining whether the firm should trade for funds to expand, they will use a cost benefit analysis. So a CBA is a financial process that allows a business to determine the opportunity cost of expansion. Essentially, you do things like this in your head all the time, but this is actually putting it on paper and doing it in a very detailed process. And it determines if an investment is an appropriate action or even if it's even feasible to do. You may decide that after a CBA that that's not even feasible for you to actually purchase some sort of equipment. Or you may decide that, it's, that you have an overwhelming need for it. So it allows for the firm to compare projects. A lot of times what firms will do is not just look at a project, but they'll look at a couple different projects. That way they get a couple of different versions as to what access and what road they want to take. So CBA places a monetary value on all aspects of a decision, including the value over time of a given decision. In other words, CBAs, of course, are evaluating opportunity cost. So developing a cost benefit analysis. So let's kind of just look at this in a general format. So we're gonna estimate the cost of expansion. What is it actually going to cost? Now we have to do an estimate. And of course that needs to be as close as possible and preferably when you're looking at an investment you want to be a little over as opposed to a little under because a little over is okay a little under is bad because now that means you need more money so you're going to calculate the expected revenues so you notice you're going to first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at total cost and total revenue because if this number does not come out positive if it's not going to equal greater profits then you should not do it so you're gonna calculate the expected profit. So the first thing is a very simple math formula. Total cost, total revenue, subtract equals profits. If that number is not a positive, that's the end of the discussion. We stop at this point. Now, then you calculate the cost of financing expansion. So how much money is it gonna cost us? How much money are we gonna make? How much profit are we gonna make? How much is it going to cost us to pay for the expansion? Not just pay for the expansion in terms of the let's we got to build this, but the interest involved in it as well. So it's more than just one factor involved. So whenever you're looking at calculating the cost of financial expansion, you have to think about the expansion itself, the, the money, but also the interest rate you're paying on that money. So that's important to remember. So does total revenue outweigh total cost? If the answer is a yes, you build. If the answer is a no, drop the project. So it's a balancing act. You know, we're taking total revenue, we're taking total cost, whichever of course is greater, then that's the direction the company will move in. So this is a cost benefit analysis for computerized customer service. Now this is uh, out of the UK, that's why you see it in pounds. Uh, it doesn't really matter in terms of that though because what we all wanna look at obviously is what we're actually seeing. So monetary values in British pounds, the concept is the same though. So will this company's decision to move towards a computerized customer service system generate greater profits? So you're looking at the top and the cost. So what's it gonna cost in terms of equipment, servers, printers, cable installations, software licensing, training of customers, and that other and man hours lost, sales lost during the initial phase. That's something you have to think about is in order to expand, and this is a key point here, you can't expand and keep your production at the same level at the same time. It's just not possible because there's only X amount of resources. So in order to expand, you have to cut production. And as you can see here, that sales loss during the initial phase is where they've cut production in order to create expansion. And that's something important to remember. Those basically work along a, a PPC curve in which you're saying, okay, if we want to expand, we're going to have to reduce production. If we want to increase production, then we have to 
push off expansion until later. That's just kind of how that sets up. So then you look at the benefits down there and you'll notice the postal campaigns, lead conversion. So the accuracy of client information, improvements in management. So the benefits are at 185,000 pounds, the total cost. So obviously this company will move forward on their actions because of this cost benefit analysis. Okay, so our next step then is to jump in and look at the financial system itself. So the financial system consists of the group of institutions in the economy that help to match a person's savings with another person's investment. So now we're beginning to look at the institutions themselves. And it's not just banks that we're going to talk about. There's other types of institutions. The financial system moves the economy's scarce resources from the savers, households, to the borrowers, the firms. So financial institutions can be grouped into two different categories. Financial markets, these are stocks and bonds. And then the financial intermediates. These are the institutions through which savers can indirectly provide funds to ours, i.e. our banks, credit institutions. So the markets allow individuals to buy stocks to trade in bonds, and that gets corporations access to capital, financial capital, whereas intermediates are actual institutions where you're saving money in a location and then they are borrowing it. So this is when we're talking about our banks and our mutual funds. So let's look at how we finance through a bank. So we take our individuals and of course what they're going to do is they're going to take their money and they're going to save it into this bank. Now what the bank does of course is loan the money out. And the bank may loan your money out to multiple places. For example, Corporation A, Corporation B, and Corporation C may all be earning loans, or sole proprietorships may be all borrowing from the bank in order to, of course, purchase or maintain physical capital. So they're borrowing financial capital. So what is the cost of that loan? Well, the answer to that is an interest rate. So payment for loans is an interest rate. That's how banks make a profit. So people make a profit because what does the bank pay people? Same thing. Banks pay individuals interest rates for putting their money in the economy, into the bank. So if the interest rate on savings is 3%, then that means the bank's going to pay you 3% of what you save. Now, if the interest rate on loans is 3% as well, then the bank will make 3% off of your money. That's the, that is the profit for the bank. That's the cost of doing business. So interest rates encourage savings. Interest rates, of course, also work on the side with loans. And, and if interest rates are high or low, that, of course, is going to have a significant impact on the savings and on the loans portions of this. Okay, so mutual funds. These are terms you may have heard if you watch football games every weekend. You see all these companies doing advertising for mutual funds. Essentially what a mutual fund is, it's an institution that sells shares to the public and uses the proceeds to buy a portfolio of various types of stocks, bonds, or both. In other words, <clears throat> instead of buying stock, you purchase a mutual fund. And a mutual fund is essentially it's a portfolio of a lot of different stocks and bonds. Now, the way that works, of course, by diversifying it is it means that overall what happens is your mutual fund in, in over time, it's going to increase in its value, but it's going to do so at a small rate because some of these stocks will go up, some will go down, but overall you'll see an increase in profit. Now, a lot of people do this because over the course of time, this is not very risky. These are pretty much guaranteed to show some sort of increase in, in value and profit. So you see a lot of times people will do this. Now, so mutual funds buy stocks and bonds for you, but in many different companies, so they're diversified. This way the overall value of the mutual fund increases despite what some individual stocks may do. Now it's less risky, of course, than just buying stocks, but there's also less potential for significant profit. And that's one of the things you have to remember here is if you're gonna purchase mutual funds, yeah, you're gonna have a pretty significant chance of increasing your profit. It won't be by much, but buying stock, though riskier, also creates, of course, the risk of generating massive profits. To give you an example, if 20 years ago I had bought Google stock, I could have bought, say, $100 worth, and I would be sitting at home on a beach somewhere and just chilling out because of how valuable that stock became, and not by spending a lot of money either. So let's look at some uh, kinds of financing. So 
It's fairly common that businesses are going to negotiate lines of credit with banks so they don't have to fill out loan applications on more than one occasion. That makes sense. If, if firms are going to constantly be working with banks, then what they'll do is work out a line of credit so that they can continuously borrow and pay back and there isn't this constant loan application like they, a person like us would have to fill out. So, in the short term financing, any borrowing of funds that will be paid off within the year. So short term means you're borrowing for that year. So this is annually and it, it's got to, you borrow at the first of the year, you got to pay off at the end of the year. An intermediate term financing is borrowing of funds that will be paid off between one and 10 years. So this typically requires collateral for the loan where short term doesn't, you can just borrow the money from it for the business. The intermediate retirement is going to require some sort of collateral. So you've got to be able to provide them with something that proves that you're going to be able to pay this off. And if you don't, guess what they get? A lot of times for businesses, this may be the business itself. It could even be a person's house within a sole proprietorship. So then our long-term financing, any borrowing of funds that will be paid off over a period of more than 10 years. So this is long-term. So this is done through the sale of stocks and bonds. So when we talk about long-term financing, a lot of times this is where we see our sales and in particular our bonds. This is a huge part of that bond is in that time period of 10 plus years, particularly in that range of say 10, 15 to 20 and 25 years. In that range is a lot of times where we see our bonds. And individuals of course can buy bonds. The government will sell bonds to you so they get your money now. 20 years from now, they'll give you your money back plus interest. It's, it's a common thing that we'll talk about. Okay, since financial capital operates through a market, and remember all markets, of course, are being regulated by supply and demand, thus there is a supply and demand for financial capital. So the demand for financial capital develops from the firm's demand for physical capital to produce goods and services. So in other words, the higher the demand for physical capital, so the higher the demand for goods to pro or for capital to produce goods and services, the higher the demand for financial capital becomes. Uh, to give you a really simple example, let's say that there was an increase in the housing market and firms needed to build more houses. Well, in order for them to build more houses, they would have to buy more of the goods they need to build houses. For example, they would need to buy more lumber, more nails, more shingles. Well, that would increase the, the, their demand for financial capital. So the quantity of financial capital supplied to the firms depends on the interest rate. And that's crucial. Okay, interest rates are the price of financial capital. So whereas a candy bar costs a dollar or whatever, financial capital cost interest rates. Interest rates and financial capital have an inverse relationship. So you'll see here, if interest rates increase, then the quantity demanded of financial capital goes down. Okay, so when interest rates are high, the demand for, the demand for loans is low, and that makes sense. So when interest rates are high, the demand for loans is low. And the reason why, of course, is because interest rates re represent the price. So a high interest rate, rate means that we're going to pay more. So an interest rate of 7% means we're going to pay more on the loan than we would at, say, 3%. So when interest rates, of course, are low, the quantity demanded of financial capital increases. So they have an inverse relationship when you're talking about the demand for quantity demanded of financial capital. So when this is essentially back to our law of demand. So when the demand for the good increases, we can see what happens. As interest rates, prices increase, quantity demanded falls. The same thing on the other side. When interest rates go down, quantity demanded rises. Okay, let's look at the demand for financial capital. So remember that as interest rates increase, the quantity demanded for financial capital decreases. What we just said, it's that inverse, and it's the same, of course, that we talked about from the very beginning because, of course, when we're talking about demand, we have to remember the law of demand. So the two primary factors that shift the demand for capital are population growth and technological change. And remember, when we talk about shifting, now we're going left to right. So as population increases, the demand for goods and services increase. Therefore, the demand for physical capital that produces the goods and services will increase as well. It makes sense. Increases in population create increases 
in the demand for physical capital. So therefore we would see an increase in the demand for financial capital. And we gotta remember, physical capital goes up, financial capital goes up with it. So when technology advances, it increases the demand for some forms of physical capital, but while decreases the demand for others. For example, if we produce a robot that is able to take orders at McDonald's and eliminate the person doing so, we're going to increase the demand for that physical capital, but we're also going to decrease the demand for the worker themselves. Now, what is the common factor in terms of determining, do we switch? Total revenue minus total cost, how much profit are we going to make and how much is it going to cost us from an investment perspective? So think about it like that. So you've got to remember that increasing population is going to create an increase in the demand for financial capital because it increases the demand for physical capital. Technology, of course, is a little more difficult to determine simply from the fact that it's going to increase some forms of physical capital while decreasing the demand for others. Okay, so let's uh, graph this out. So as interest rates go down, the quantity of financial capital demanded goes up. So we can see here as we begin to plot out some points, interest rates are decreasing. As they do so, what we see, of course, is the quantity of financial capital that is being demanded goes up. And we call it KD, so quantity demanded of financial capital is KD. Just get used to that, which means KS is supply. So lower interest rates mean that borrowers pay less for the financing they trade for. So, and you'll hear this sometimes when you hear about the Fed, and we'll talk about this, the Fed lowering or increasing interest rates. So if the Federal, if the Federal Reserve decides that they're going to increase interest rates, effectively what they're saying is they're going to reduce the market for loans. If the Federal Reserve says they're going to decrease interest rates, then effectively what they're saying is they're going to increase the market for loans. So what of course we see, pretty simple, interest rates falling means that quantity demanded uh, financial capital thus increases. So we can look here, we start, we'll just say point A, 4.0 interest rate. And that of course leads us to let's just say 5.5 million in financial capital being quantity demand. Now, when the interest rate falls to 2.25%, we see an increase to 8 million, of course, in what is demanded. So that decline creates an increase. Okay, let's look at the supply of financial capital. So as interest rates rise, the supply of financial capital increases. And we can see that here, just like with our law of supply, increases in interest rates create an incentive to households to save more money, so thus supplying more quantity of financial capital. When interest rates are falling, the incentive, of course, for us to save is decreased. So financial intermediaries become more willing and able to supply capital for production and growth and maintenance when, of course, interest rates are high. And as interest rates increase, they become more willing and more able to supply. We become more willing and able, of course, to save, thus increasing their supplies. So the supply of financial capital comes from how much people save. So interest rates works much like prices do in the market then because the interest rate equals the price. High interest rates equal financial intermediaries that are or banks that are more willing to loan. It also creates people who are more willing to save. So in order for people to save money, there must be an incentive and the incentive of course for saving is interest rates. So the higher the interest rate, the greater the incentive to save and thus the greater the quantity of savings supplied. The greater amount of money saved today, the greater amount it will become in the future. And that's kind of the key part here that you have to think about, is when you're talking about this, what you're talking about with interest rates is we are saving money now for the future. Because what we're doing is we're banking on saving it now and the interest rate generating more money down the road. It's not like we're saving today because we expect to pull it tomorrow because that doesn't generate any interest. We're saving from a long-term perspective. So you can forget about this being a short-term concept. Whenever people are saving money, this is a long-term deal because they're saving money in order to allow that money to become more money in the future through the, the interest rates. 
Okay, so a second ago we looked at what caused a shift in the demand for financial capital and we saw that population increases and decreases and then changes in the technology will cause the uh, demand for financial capital to change, to shift. So there's three main influences on the supply of savings. The first being population. So if population increases, so too will the supply of savings because there's just more potential people to out there to save money. Uh, savings converts current income into future income because of the collected interest of savings. So if you increase the population and you're increasing the number of people who are putting money into the bank, therefore, of course, you're increasing the amount or the supply of financial capital. Uh, the second being average income. So if average income and savings supply have a positive relationship, the reason for this is pretty simple. As average income and household increases, so do so does the proportion of savings. So since most people save a fairly consistent proportion of their income, a percentage, so an increase in their income would then increase the proportion of their savings. So let's say, for example, you're saving 5% of your income. Well, if your income increased by $50,000, that would be awesome. It would also, of course, just cause that 5%. Then you would now see an increase of your, your savings of whatever your current income is plus that extra $50,000. The third is future income. Um, to give you an idea on this, for example, if a household currently has a low income and its expected future income is high, then the household will not save in the present but would in the future. So as income increases, people become more willing to save is essentially what that's saying. So let's graph our supply of financial capital. So as interest rates go up, the quantity of savings supplied goes up as well. So as we can see, watching our dots appear. We'll see that our line increases here. So as interest rates increase, the quantity of financial capital supply does increase as well. Now we call it KS. So if you see KD and KS, remember we're talking about capital here and it's capital demanded and capital supplied. So pretty simple. Increases in interest rates create increases in the quantity supplied of financial capital. So the higher interest rates create an incentive and for supply, the amount of money financial institutions are willing to loan is also based on the interest rate. So the fact that we're saving more money, it also increases the likelihood that the bank is more willing to loan because the interest rate for them, of course, remember interest rates are going to equal profit. So as rates increase, they're willing to, to loan more money because that's the greater revenues for them. So when we can kind of plot it out here, so at 4%, you would see the quality of financial capital supplied is five. When we increase that to 5.5%, we'll notice, of course, that our financial capital supply increases to seven. So that's that basic deal with, with, within the market. The same thing we talk about price and supply and demand. The same principles are applying. Okay, so let's look at the market equilibrium for financial capital. So market equilibrium occurs when quantity supplied, quantity demand of financial capital, they intersect. So we can take the QD, quantity demand of financial capital, which we call KD in this sense. And with our KS, our quantity supplied, we can have those two lines intersect at this point. And that gives us an equilibrium of financial capital. So in this example, that's about 4.25% at a quantity of 5.3 million in financial capital. Now, if supply were to shift to the right, say for a population increase, then we would of course notice that the interest rate on our financial capital falls, while our quantity of financial capital, of course, increases. So in this case, what we see is that as interest rates go down, of course, the supply of financial capital thus increases. So it's like, like we would normally see in a market. So now we will look at three government policies that affect savings and investments. So there are three policies that affect savings and investment. The first is a tax on savings, then a tax on investment, and then government budget deficits. So let's look at a tax on savings first. So taxes on interest earned from savings accounts reduce the future payout from current savings accounts. So if the government places a tax on the interest earned from savings account, in other words, they're taxing households for the interest they earn, then essentially what they're doing is they're reducing the future payout. They're reducing the amount of money you would get in the future. 
This decreases the incentive to save money. If I told you that in 10 years, you were going to be able to get X amount of dollars out of it, then the government is going to take from that amount. You might be less likely, of course, to then save that money. So if the government placed a 1.25% tax on savings, the result will be a rise in the interest rate paid by consumers of financial capital. So it would increase what we pay and then it would decrease the amount paid to the suppliers because all the tax does is creates, so you can think about it like a wedge and I'll actually give you a visual of this so you can see what it looks like. So if the government were to reduce the tax on savings, then the opposite would hold true. Quantity of financial capital would increase as there would be a greater incentive to save. So. So let's look at a visual here of this financial market with a tax on savings. So if we bring up our quantity demand in financial capital and we bring up our quantity supplied, so then that gives us our equilibrium at 4.25% uh, and 5.3 million quantities supplied. So when the government places a tax on the interest rates, KS1 rises by the amount of the tax, which is 1.25%. So that line increases, but it shifts upward by 1.25%. So what was it 4.25? So now at that moment, that line would be at 5.5%, but that is not the actual rate. Rather, the rate is going to be right here. So this is what the consumers and the producers of financial capital, this is the rate at which they're, they're looking at. So what we're saying here is 4.65. So the result is an increase in the interest rate that consumers demand so firms are going to demand an interest rate of 4.65, okay? So because the interest rate increased for consumers of financial supply, we know their demand is going to fall. And it drops here, so it goes straight down, down to that 4, we'll say 4.3, 4.4. So, and here's the other issue with this. Suppliers only receive financial capital of 3.4%, which is right there. Because you'll notice, and this is where it gets interesting. So if you look at the top line, if we look here, what we're seeing is this is the amount that firms are paying for financial capital. This is the amount that suppliers are actually receiving. So there's a difference in the two amounts. And then down here is the actual quantity that's being supplied. So the government essentially is creating a wedge between the two numbers. So when we look at it, this results in a fall in the amount they're willing to supply from 5.3 to 4.4 million. And so you can see these two points here. This is where our, our, our points are lined up. Now this is the wedge. So that blue part represents the wedge. So when a tax is created, it creates a wedge. In this case, there's a wedge between what firms are paying for financial capital and what suppliers are actually receiving. And the, that wedge is tax revenue. So that is, that's what's going to take place here, is that when taxes are created on savings, firms must pay a higher rate suppliers receive a lower rate, and as a result, the quantity supplied falls. The wedge that's created between what the two pay, that's the tax revenue on the interest rate. So now if you're the government, doing this, of course, earns you money, but it's also going to decrease the amount of money that companies are willing to to invest for financial capital. And so that doesn't exactly help you overall from the economic standpoint. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is a tax on investment. So when a tax on savings affects the supply of financial capital, a tax on investment affects the demand. Now, tax credits are used by the government to encourage purchasing of financial capital. A tax on investors would reduce the demand for financial capital. So a credit is going to increase the demand and a tax will decrease it. So tax credits, which say, okay, we're not going to make you pay the tax that would encourage us to purchasing a financial capital. An actual tax on the investors would reduce the demand. 
It's highly unlikely, though, since it would stall the growth of firms and production. Any government that's willing to tax investors is paying absolutely no attention to what's happening within the market. So we can actually graph this and take a look at it and look at a tax credit to increase demand. So here's a quantity supplied of financial credit. And here is the KD1. So this is our demand. So remember, we're looking at a tax credit, so we want to increase the demand. So our current equilibrium is here. Now, if the interest rate was 4.25%, quantity demanded of financial capital would be 5.3. Suppose the government gave consumers a tax credit of 1.75%. So they're going to give a tax credit that would cause the demand for financial capital to increase by the amount of the tax and thus shift KD up by 1.75. So what you're going to notice is a new line here with a new equilibrium. So notice how our demand, it increased, and it increased, of course, by the amount of the tax credit. So this amount here, that 1.75, that's going to increase that amount, and that gives us our new demand. So this is that 1.75% increase in tax credit. So the tax credit is going to shift demand to the right. Okay, so a tax credit would shift demand to the right. So now here we can see what, we, what we're doing. So in this sense, we would increase the quantity demanded for financial capital from 5.3 million to 6 million. So we're going to increase the demand for it. So you can see here, we see this increase first in the interest rates. Now that, of course, when the interest rates increase, that means suppliers are going to be more than willing and able to supply as well. So then we see this shift too here that the tax credits. So tax credits create a shift in demand and thus increase the demand for financial capital, but it also, of course, now it allows, because the interest rates go up, suppliers are then more willing to supply. So this policy creates a greater incentive to buy financial capital, which would in turn increase the firm's productivity. So if you're the government and you want to encourage growth within the economy, one of the ways you could do that would be to offer a tax credit to firms for financial capital. So our third method here is government budget deficits. Um, when government spending outpaces the government's budget, deficits develop. This is every single year in the United States. As I'm speaking, it's going up. It's already in the trillions. And if I were to just sit here and talk for a very, very long time, it would end up going up by billions. So U.S. government deficits have begun to accumulate into the trillions. So it's like 18 trillion. Sometimes the government borrows to finance reductions in that debt. It kind of seems silly to me. What's the point of even borrowing to finance a debt of $18 trillion? But they do it. So when the government chooses this policy, it leads to a reduction in supply of financial capital. And this kind of makes sense because if you think about it, there's only X amount of supply out there. And the government is buying off a portion of that, which reduces the amount of supply that's left available for our companies to use. And we call this term crowding out because the government crowds out other potential buyers of financial capital. So not only does this, does this method uh, actually not really help us that much because of the debt is so high, but all it does is seems to effectively reduce the amount of financial capital that's available for firms to actually purchase. So this results in a shift in financial capital supplied to the left. The result is an increase in interest rates for firms and households. So when we look at it like this, so the impact of government borrowing. So here we have our demand and here we have our supply. We have our market equilibrium. So when the market is in equilibrium, the interest rate is 4, 2.5%. Quantity of financial capital is 5.3. So there we go. Now, when the government borrows to finance, it de finance its debt, it reduces the supply of financial capital, shifting KS to the left. Okay, so this results in an increase in the interest rate. So we'll see here, it moves. And so now all of a sudden the interest rate is increased and the financial qu quantity has decreased. We see this point here. So this is the result. So when the government borrows money, KS shifts to the left and increases the interest rate but decreases the quantity available. And that's because they're simply taking it out of the market. So we can see here, we see this increase. And we see that the decrease in the financial capital that's actually available. So if the government were to say borrow, let's just say $7 trillion to finance an $18 trillion debt, 
Well, then that would mean that there's $7 trillion less dollars available for financial investment for firms to purchase. So that would cause interest rates to go up, would cause the supply to go down.